this morning. So glad that you came to worship the Lord with us on this beautiful Sunday morning. Uh, this is our missions weekend, and we have been having a great weekend together, just celebrating the spread of the gospel all around the world. On Friday evening, we had an international food tasting event and our missions parade, and uh, what a great time it was. I want to say thank you to everyone who brought a dish. I never even, I only made it halfway around the world. I got. Let's raise up your banners! City, Australia. Uh, Rory is the senior pastor of River of Life Church in Logan City. She is also the overseer of the HIM Apostolic Network in Australia, in the Pacific Islands, and uh, many churches in India. And so she oversees, uh, in addition to her own congregation, hundreds of churches uh, in their part of the world. They served as missionaries in Papua New Guinea for 10 years as a young married couple, and they are still involved with the work of missions uh, all around the world. She has just brought us great words uh, Saturday morning, uh, last night, this morning at 8.30, and she has a word to share with us today. I want to ask you if you'd stand on your feet and give your very best welcome for our friends David and Rory Jensen. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. This is my husband, Dave. Um, he's my first husband. And uh, for that matter, he has been my first husband for 46 years. So, so we're a couple of dinosaurs, but we're still hanging in there, you know, on the planet. And uh, so I want Dave to bring a greeting and say hello to you this morning. Yeah, good day. Well, it is indeed a privilege to be here with you on this weekend. Um, missions is dear to our heart. And um, when we first came in here into the auditorium, I think I came on Friday, and uh, they were just putting the flags up around the, the wall here. And they're about to put up our favorite country. The last flag on that side there is the flag of Papua New Guinea. And that's where we've spent um, most of our um, mission life, or well, at least as a family we were there for 10 years as uh, the pastor has already said and um, for the last 13 years we've been involved in going to part of Papua New Guinea but it's a small island uh, off of Papua New Guinea called Bougainville and so it is indeed a privilege to be here with you uh, this weekend and to share the heart of God. I was just watching that that little clip as we were giving. And on the end it said go. Go means go. What part of, G, of go don't you understand? The G or the O? I remember um, a message by Reinhard Bonnke and he said, yeah, what part of go don't you understand? It means go. But it is indeed a privilege because as we can encourage one another um, we can become more fruitful in going and reaching not only overseas, but our neighbours right beside us. Yeah. So thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Good on you, Dave. <laughs> Dave is a missionary extraordinaire. Like, I go and do the kind of the sooky stuff, you know, the sissy stuff. Dave goes and he has a walkabout sawmill and so he takes his walkabout sawmill into the jungles and he fells the trees right there on the spot, has the sawmill set up around the trees and then he, he strips the trees and slabs them out. Sorry for the greenies, but we've got to kind of 
build a house. And uh, so he slabs that out on the spot, cuts all the timber up. And then he's invented this little kind of machine. It's like a tractor, but it's a homemade thingy, so it can get up the creeks and that. And he calls it a bush rat. And, uh, and so he can, with his bush rat, pull the timber that he's just cut out of the jungle. And then, while the timber is still bleeding and crying, <laughs> he, he builds a medical clinic or a school or a pastor's house or something with that timber. So he's the hard worker and he does it all. The people up there love him dearly um, because he's just one with them. He just sits around the fireplace and, and talks to the chiefs and, and they're just one heart. Um, so much so that in the last 14 years that we've been going to this particular island that he mentioned called Bougainville in Papua New Guinea, um, the people there decided they wanted to adopt us or they wanted to adopt him. I just kind of tagged on in there, you know. I was a bit of collateral damage or something. So I just went with him and, and, and they wanted to adopt us into their clan, which was about the, the highest privilege they could give to us. Because in this land, if you are adopted tribally, constitutionally, you're also recognized as a, as a citizen. And so it was a wonderful privilege to us. And I found that adoption, you know, the Bible talks about we have been adopted as sons. I found that adoption changes things dramatically. At first, when they said they wanted to adopt us, I thought, well, that's a nice touch. Hey, good on yous, you know. But, but as, as the, th the whole thing started to progress and we went through the ceremony of getting our hair all painted and, and wearing leaves and stuff, <laughs> and the whole thing unfolded, I began to realise that actually adoption changes your relationships. You know, it changes your inheritance. It changes so much that you just don't understand until you've actually been adopted. And so as part of the adoption process, they believe that if you're a citizen there, you, you must have land. So as part of the adoption process, they gave us 10 acres. What the? Well, you know, this is pretty cool. Um, you can't buy land there. Like the mining companies, because of the wealth that's in the soil and the copper and the gold and whatnot, the, the mining companies, the big mining companies want to be in there. Um, and they can't get a look in. But these guys gave us 10 acres overlooking the Pacific Islands, overlooking the Pacific Ocean, just absolutely fabulous, high on a cliff. Like, all righty then, we like this adoption thing. Bring it on, you know. And, and so what we want to do there is to build a, um, a training centre. Um, the island that we go to has been totally devastated. It's been um, through 10 years of civil war, mining companies arguing, and, and so the whole island has been devastated. There were no schools, no hospitals, no doctors, no nurses, no policemen, no law, no nothing. It was the West, man, and you could go in there and do whatever. So bit by bit, we've been working with them and pegging back the, the hopelessness of the situation. <coughs> Excuse me. And, and so we've now been given this, this amazing um, piece of land. And so we want to uh, build a training center there to train them, not just in uh, the ways of the spirit, but also to train them in some of the physical things that they need to be able to understand to get on in this Western world. So, um, but Dave's just, he's the man, you know, he's the man. Um, uh, he goes away for quite some length of time, and so I go up to this island halfway through his long stint up there so that we're not away from each other for too long because even though we've been married for 46 years, we still kind of like each other, <laughs> you know, and uh, <clears throat> so we... Uh, I go up there and do conferences or seminars or, you know, whatever, whatever. 
and uh, so it's a, it's an amazing um, it's an amazing place, and we want to prepare a place for some of the people here from. Uh, America and from Australia to be able to go and be there in a measure of comfort while they minister to the people because it's not a lot of fun if you take a guest speaker and all you can do is give them a room with a rat in it and um, <laughs> a scungy mattress. So um, so we're kind of going to up the ante a bit there and, uh, um, yeah, bring the people into a better place. You know, I love missions. God loves missions. The first great missionary was Jesus himself leaving the glories of heaven and stepping down onto this planet and uh, piercing the darkness here with an amazing message of the Father's love. So he was the first missionary and he said, So send I you. So send I you as the Father has sent me. And so we have a, um, a heart's desire to go. It's not as easy to go and swim the rivers and climb the mountains as it used to be. But now we want to see others go, younger people just able to take the message into places that have never, ever heard the gospel. And uh, tribal people as well as Muslim cities, uh, the world needs to hear. Because you know what? We actually get to win. We are winners, not losers. Um, when you hear the news and you read the papers, you think, dear Jesus, you know, we're going down the gurgler fast. But that's just what the news is saying. You know, I read the book and the last page says, you know, we do all right here. We actually get to win. <clears throat> you know, we win. We win. The kingdom of God started with one, the king himself. Soon it became 3, became 12, became 50, became 70, became 150, became 3,000. The mustard seed became the biggest tree in the garden. You know, the dough that entered into the flower permeated the whole thing. It's the kingdom of God. So we're not sort of struggling little people hoping to God that the rapture comes before the next deacon backslides. You know, well, that's not us. We're on the front foot. We're seeing God move. And today there's a billion Christians on the planet. And it is the biggest religion globally that there is. So we're not hiding in a dark corner. We're coming out aggressively taking over the darkness. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you know, we need to be able to look back over our lives and know that we didn't just uh, suck up oxygen and take up space. We actually need to be able to look back over our lives and know that we landed in heaven, thoroughly used up, totally worn out, loudly proclaiming, yee what a ride that was. That's the way we need to be able to do life. We often are far too conservative and so caring of ourselves and I'm guilty, Your Honour, as charged of that very thing. But there's, there's a way to do life that actually impacts many people for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's an awesome way to do it. It's the only way to do it. Hallelujah. Well, you know, I'm going to start at the beginning, my favourite part of Scripture, because everything... Every subject you ever want to talk on, everything comes out of this scripture. It's the way God does things. It's from Genesis and it's the seedbed. It's the beginning of all things. And it, it's just so I just begin most sermons with it. So, you know, I'm doing a few here this morning. So probably just have to get used to that. <laughs> but the scripture is Genesis 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God, good on God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form. It was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. It was chaos. And it says, and the spirit of God hovered 
I think you said Hubbard. What did you say? Hubbard. You said Hubbard? Hubbard's okay? Hubbard! Anyway, like a chicken on an egg. That's the word. Hover. The Spirit of God was hovering over the chaotic mess and darkness on the planet. And nothing is happening except the Spirit is hovering. You know, it is the nature of spirit to hover. It doesn't matter whether it's the Holy Spirit or an evil spirit, spirits hover. And so here in Genesis 1, 1, the earth is without form, darkness, chaos, and the spirit is hovering. And for how long, we don't know. Depends on your doctrine, whether it was a day or a thousand years or a millennium or God knows what not. We won't go there today, but the spirit was hovering. And nothing's happening. Not a blooming thing. And the spirit hovered over the darkness. Then verse 2, thank God for verse 2, because it says this. And God said... And the Spirit said, oh, yippee, somebody's doing something. And God said, let there be light. So that immediately released the Spirit from hovering because he's the administrator of the Godhead. And it released the Spirit from hovering because a word had come forth from God. And words give Spirit a track to run on. And so as the word came forth, let there be, the spirit went from hovering into doing and to bringing forth the word that had been spoken, let there be light. And God saw the light and it was good. And the spirit was pleased because he was getting tired of hovering. The, The Holy Spirit always performs the word of God. It's his job. It's his job. He always performs the word of God. He hasn't changed his nature from that day to this. So if you speak the word of God into a situation, it gives the Holy Spirit access to perform the word of God in that situation. So instead of whinging, do you have whinging? Instead of complaining... about your situation, you need to speak the word because the Spirit's just going to hover waiting for you to and he's not going to get on your word of, I don't like this place and everything's down, I'm really depressed. He's not going to get on that word. Some demon will get on that word. But if if you speak the word of the Lord over over the situation, then the Holy Spirit will get on it. And he will have access into your situation and into your life. So speak the word. Speak the word. Well, a few days go by. We're still in Genesis 1. And it says, And God made man in his own image, in the likeness of God. And it says, And God breathed into his nostrils. Can't you just see a clay image, a dirt bag? <laughs> Anybody ever called you a dirt bag? Just go. <laughs> and God, he didn't just speak now. He's actually getting involved. He's using his hands and he gets down and he actually gets up this bloke's nose. <laughs> He breathes into man's nostrils. And that phrase, breathed into his nostrils, actually means God deposited his assets in man. God deposited his assets right from the word go. God considered us dirtbags worthy to carry his assets. So he created us in his image. 
and he put into mankind the capacity to host the Holy Ghost. He put it into us when he created us. An ability, a spirit that would be able to carry the Holy Spirit. As well as that, he gave us creative intelligence. He gave us passion. He gave us all the assets that God himself had. Because he's got a plan. So what's this got to do with missions? Well, it's got everything to do with missions. Because it's just a bunch of us dirtbags that take the message of the gospel of Jesus all around the world. We speak the word and the Holy Ghost gets on it. That's about it. I can finish right there, Pastor. (laughs) You know, many people say to me, I'd really love to be in missions. I I really want your anointing. And I said, well, you can't have it. Can't get your own. I had to. Why should you get a cheapskate? <laughs> I'd love to be involved, but I'm just, you know, I'm just, you know, I'm just, a, I'm just really average. I've got kids uh, cooking sausages for dinner. I'm just like, this is like, I'm not one of them. Well, I want to tell you that all God has is average. Yeah. Average dirt bags. That's all he's got. That's all he's got. He's only ever had ordinary people. We read the scriptures and we see all these greats. And it's just they weren't great until the Holy Ghost got on them. You know, they're pretty average, really. He doesn't have a special species that he has put aside for a time when God might have a need. So he can call on a bunch of human beings to help him out of his troubles. No, he's got you and me, and he's got a plan. And you're part of that plan. It's called missions. It's called go into all the world. It doesn't necessarily mean you physically have to go to Africa or to Papua New Guinea. Though I tell you what, you'll get a buzz if you do. It's like a blowfly up the nose. You'll get a buzz. (laughs) Get involved in missions. Get involved in short-term missions. But it does mean that there's... A process of you becoming involved in the going of, in the, uh, by giving and by praying. Pastor Jeff been praying for missions last night and this morning. I just love that. I just love that because I've been a missionary out there thinking, oh, I don't think that anybody even knows I'm here, let alone anybody praying for me. You know, so It's good to hear prayers for missions in churches. It's a, it's a really awesome thing. He's given us the Great Commission. And he gave it to ordinary dirt bags like you and me. People who just happen to be created in his image. You know, I, I just one day at home, um, I was feeling a bit down. Now, I'm a happy little sanguine, really, so if I get down, I don't stay down. But this was one of those days when I was having a sanguine flip out. <laughs> And I went outside into the backyard and my husband, God bless him, he's, he's what we call in Australia a shed bloke. He's got a shed. It's like a man cave or I don't know what you guys call it, but he's a bloke and he's got a shed and it's full of men's stuff. <laughs> you know, like 45 hammers and 26 screwdrivers and a 1966 Harley Davidson, which he has repaired and restored to an amazing place. So he's got a shed, he does shed stuff. Um, And if I want him, I buzz him on his mobile phone because I don't like the shed myself. (laughs) So, but anyway, this day I was depressed enough to go and sit down outside the shed and I'm praying and I'm like, oh, shaka. So I'm praying in tongues. And you know tongues are supposed to edify? I wasn't really praying in tongues. I was just whinging, just complaining to God. (laughs) And I heard these words come out of my mouth. I don't know whether it was the interpretation to the tongue or what. But I heard these words, and I said, God, I feel like a potsherd. 
And I thought to myself, what the heck is a potsherd? Never heard of that before. But I'm calling myself a potsherd. So I got up. I told you I was sanguine. I got over it. I went into the house and I looked up potsherd. And I found out that a potsherd was, in the Bible days, it was a piece of broken pottery that had been discarded. So I got that bit right. That's what I was feeling like, a piece of broken, discarded pottery. But then it went on to say a potsherd, the broken piece of pottery, was used to carry fire from one fireplace to the next fireplace. So I went, oh, right then. I'm a potsherd. I'm a potsherd. Listen, we're all potsherds. We're all pieces of broken humanity that have been smashed somewhere in life on the rocks. And we're not altogether whole. Uh, if you're altogether whole, you probably don't need a saviour. Yeah. Right. You know. But, but we're not altogether whole. We're broken over the issues of life and we've been discarded and we're just lying there and there's no use. We can't even carry water. But, but what you do with the pot shirt is you just scoop up, and this happens all the time in New Guinea, just scoop up a piece of fire, a few coals, and they would go on their way. They would scoop it into the bamboo. But here I'm talking about a, a pot shirt. So they'd scoop it up and they'd take the fire with them so that when they got there they didn't have to light another fire. They already had the coals from the previous fire. Now, you know what? I believe God's wanting to build us who are pot shirts. Dirt bags to be carriers of the fire of God from one fireplace to the next fireplace. And if you think God's looking for special people, well, then you're it. When he put you together, he knew who you were. He knew you in your mother's womb. He knit you together. He didn't drop a stitch. He got the knitting right. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He understood all about you. There's no surprises in you that can make him feel a bit undone or threatened. That's good news, eh? Yeah. Luke chapter 6. Jesus. Jesus is on the planet. He's about to appoint his apostles. And uh, verse 12, it says, One of those days, Jesus went up to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them whom he designated apostles. Simon, who was named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was the, called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Now it says here that Jesus prayed, he spent the night praying. A Jewish night was from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Now I can do the math. That's 12 hours. So he's there praying to God for 12 hours. And I've got to ask you, why would it be if after 12 hours of prayer, he picks this lot? Serious? You would have thought that he would have known to pick people who would have been more dependable then the sons of Zebedee, who wanted to call down fire and cook a whole village because they got upset there. <laughs> Serious. You would have thought that he might have found someone better than Peter, who didn't even pass the rooster test. <laughs> you might have thought he would have known that Judas was actually going to Stick his fingers in the till and knock off some of the dough. You might have thought that he would have known that Thomas was forever going to doubt. Surely, 
After 12 hours of prayer, you can do better than that, Jesus. So what was he praying about? I figure that Jesus that night, he was wrestling with the Father. Because like all of us, he would want to have been successful on the planet. He was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. And he's there saying, Father, not my will, but yours be done. So he didn't go down to downtown Jerusalem to the university there. He didn't go to Wall Street and pick the best of the best. He picked this mob. And we all know that they weren't worthy. They were your average dirtbags. And they were hardly worthy to be called apostles, sons of Zebedee. Did he choose 12 supermen? Not at all. No, he just got who he got. He could have picked him at random, for all we know, except it had already been written of Judas Iscariot that he was going to stuff up pretty big. He's still choosing ordinary, average, everyday people because he knows it's not about how awesome his followers are. It's going to be about how powerful the Holy Spirit is. How powerful the Holy Spirit is. Ah. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Check your pulse. If you're on the planet, earthen vessels. Dirt bags, average. So that the excellency of the power might be of God and not of man. So he'll do more with average, with the Holy Spirit, in one day than what he could do with all the intelligentsia of the world in a decade without the Holy Ghost. Ha ha. So he certainly got pretty average guys. I want to tell you their state before he sent them out into the world to preach the gospel. Mark. 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 I love the book of Mark. It was probably written by a young man. I don't know if you... Mark was a bit of a dobber. Do you have a dobbers here? You know, they dob on people. They tell the real story. Except I noticed Mark didn't dob on himself when he said that there was a young man. He sort of ran away in the garden naked. He just said it was a young man. He didn't say it was him, which it was, apparently. So anyway, we, we all kind of cover our own. No pun intended. Sometimes you dig a hole and you end up in China. How are you doing out there? You doing all right? Are you understanding my Aussie accent? I'm, I'm trying not to throw in too many Aussie-isms because otherwise it's a totally different language. It's... You know, it's not exactly English, and uh, Aussies understand it, but hey, you'd get a bit lost in all that stuff. Well, Mark, chapter 16. These are his disciples. <coughs> it says, when, uh, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had driven seven demons. He went, uh, sorry, she went, and told those who had been with him and who were mourning and weeping. And when they heard that Jesus was alive and that she had seen him, they did not believe it. Just mark that. That's one strike. They did not believe it. Afterwards, Jesus appeared to two uh, different forms of two of them while they were walking in the country. And they returned and they reported to the rest but they did not believe them either. Strike two. Later, Jesus appeared to the 11 as they were eating. Here's strike three coming up. He rebuked them for their lack of faith and their stubborn refusal to believe those who had seen him after he had risen. They did not believe him. 
They did not believe them either. Jesus rebuked them for their lack of faith and stubborn refusal. That's verse 14. Verse 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the good news. Well, wait up. Here's a bunch of unbelievers. They don't even believe yet. I'm not even going to go shopping with these. They're, they're full of doubt. They're doubt ridden. They're scared. They didn't believe the woman on her first missionary journey from the tomb to downtown Jerusalem when Jesus said, Go and tell my brethren. They didn't believe her. They didn't believe the guys on the Emmaus Road that had spent the day walking with Jesus. And then Jesus says, you're just a bunch of unbelievers. And he rebuked them. And right there with the rebuke, he says, now go into all the world and preach about it. I'm like, say, what? Go into the world and preach. So Jesus, you're sending out unbelievers? Is that what you're doing? You're sending out doubt-ridden, doubt-ridden believers to go and preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, something had to happen between verse 14 and verse 15 because you wouldn't send these guys anywhere because they don't even believe in what they're doing. They don't even believe the Saviour's risen. They don't believe anything. They're just full of doubt. So, Jesus, why would you, why would you send them out into all the world? Well, Jesus knows it's never going to be by their power anyway. It's never going to be by how good they are. It's only ever going to be because the Holy Spirit, will, who is hovering over us, omnipresent, it's only ever going to be because the Holy Spirit is going to get on the words they speak. And in so doing, there will be an access made into the hearts and minds of people in the darkest corners of the earth because they spoke the word. Let there be, and there was, and it was good. Let there be. Let there be light. Let there be light. That's all any of us have got, really. We just got a message. We got a message. Well, we have this treasure, this anointing, this amazing thing that we're carting around with us. <laughs> we have this treasure in earthen vessels. So if you're sitting there thinking you're not good enough, big enough, great enough, to do missions, to be involved, you actually qualify. <laughs> that qualifies you. Welcome, dirtbags, to missions. <laughs> Someone will come and speak to you about self-esteem another time. But for today, <laughs> but for today, Here's the great news. The gospel has been entrusted. The gospel has been entrusted to ordinary, doubt-ridden people. I've preached sometimes and I'm thinking, Jesus, I wish I believed that. <laughs> you think, oh, wow, that's really bad. I oh, know it's bad. I'm a dirt bag. I just said it. And you know what? The Holy Spirit says, you just preach it and I'll get to you later. You just preach it. I'll get to you later. How many times have I prayed for healing and I've thought, I hope they got faith because I ain't got none. And the person gets healed. And I go, what the? Well, the Holy Ghost was hovering. That's what the? That's what it was. Oh. See, he's only got us. He hasn't got another plan. God didn't trust angels with this gospel message. He didn't trust the angels. He only trusted us. How cool is that? When Cornelius in the book of Acts wanted to find the way of salvation, an angel shows up and says, you've got to go find Peter, and Peter will tell you how to be saved. Why? Why? Because it's not their job. 
because they have never experienced salvation. They cannot know the joy that our salvation brings, so they don't qualify. You do. You qualify to carry the fire of the gospel. You qualify. Woohoo! What an incredible privilege to speak the word of God. Knowing that the Holy Spirit will get on the words, sometimes even if you're in doubt. He has no doubt whatsoever. Hello. Hello. Good on you, God. You know, when the guys were in the upper room, 120 of them, and the Spirit came, They had already been told by John the Baptist that there was one coming who would baptise with spirit and with fire. Do you know, church, we have been baptised in the Holy Ghost. For me, it took 25 years because I was a bit slow. After I was born again, I I I grew up in a church that did not believe in the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So it took me a while. (sighs) 25 years. However, I did receive an amazing baptism in the Holy Ghost. But you know what? I believe that we, many of us, including myself, are yet to experience the and with fire bit. And with fire. And with fire. There's a fire coming. There's a fire. Shh. Hey, there's a flame that landed on their head. Shaka. And in that flame, in that flame was heat. It was the heat of passion of love for God. In that flame, there was light. It was revelation of who he was. And in that flame, there was a power and ignition and explosion. And I'm telling you that there's coming a baptism of fire that's going to lob on our heads and we will understand something of light and of power and of passion. Ah, whoo-wee! It's not the fire of God's wrath, but it's a fire that will cook up everything that is secondary. Everything. See, Jesus stepped into the fire. The man of fire stepped into the fire of God's wrath and the fire said, I've had enough. I can't eat this stuff. He's bigger than I am. This is another kind of fire that I can't devour. I quit. And Jesus steps out of the fire to bring fire to his disciples, a fire that will never end, a fire that will never go out, unquenchable. Our God is a consuming fire. Hey, pillar of fire, cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. And that fire, the most high God of the Old Testament, up there in the sky, the most high becomes the most nigh God. And that fire separates and lands on humanity at Pentecost. Woo-wee! And the most high became the most nigh. And he sent us out. He sent us out. Our God is a consuming fire. Angels and the Spirit of the Lord ascends on the flame from the sacrifice. An amazing, an amazing God. Pentecost talks about wind and fire. An unstoppable, an unstoppable force. An amazing, incredible, unstoppable force. In Australia, we had these major bushfires. I mean, major bushfires. I mean, you ain't seen nothing yet. Major bushfires. Because of the, the gum trees, the eucalypt oil in the gum trees, when the fire hits it, they explode. So it's just like little bombs going off. And the wind gets in that stuff, and like thousands upon thousands upon thousands of acres, it's just burnt to a crisp. Wind and fire, powerful force. Church, he's not going to leave us hanging loose with missions. He's going to come. He's going to come. And he's going to say to us, you go, you speak, 
I'll do the rest. Now, if you're not able to go, you're sure able to support those who do. And you're sure able to pray because we get to win. God said, amen. Wow. What a word. The Spirit of God is hovering, waiting for us to speak. You know, missions, uh, Paul wrote to the Romans, is about sending and it's about speaking. How shall they hear unless they're told? Unless they release the word that releases the hovering spirit. And how shall they tell them unless they are sent? So God wants to do something. He wants to use us in both sending and in speaking. He wants us to open our mouths and to speak ourselves at work, in our neighborhood, in our circle of friends, everywhere we come and contact people. I walked into the bank where I go every week one day and uh, the Holy Spirit just told me when I walked in the door, uh, I usually almost always go to the same teller if she's there and available. And the Holy Spirit just said, tell her it's gonna be all right. So I walked up to her window and I said, you know, it's gonna be all right. And she just immediately started weeping. And she said, thank you, I needed to hear that. I needed to hear that today. I needed that word. God wants to use you in speaking. And he also wants to use all of us together in sending. And that's what the faith pledge card is about. I asked you at the beginning of the service to just take a look at that card. Would you take that card out now? For the last 30 years, once a year, we've asked those that call Harvest Time home, the members of our family, and those that worship with us to, to prayerfully consider making a commitment to giving to missions. This is for the year 2014, uh, for the next 12 months until we have our next missions weekend at the, be uh, at the beginning of 2015. So it's giving to missions for the coming year. Maybe uh, the Lord could do something through you on a weekly basis, maybe a monthly basis. Uh, some people prefer to give uh, one time uh, in the year. But let me say this to you, you will, you will never know until we get to heaven what God has done with your seeds and the gifts that you've given and how God has made them multiply and return. It's a good thing that we're going to be in heaven forever because it's going to take many millennia for you to hear all the stories of what God did with your seed on earth. Had an unbelievable thing happen on Friday evening. Uh, our missionaries, Bill and Connie McDonald from Cuenca, Ecuador, Skyped in. And so we got to talk to them on the big screens via Skype. Bill McDonald is one of the very first missionaries that we ever started supporting here at Harvest Time over 25 years ago. The very first missions trip that we ever took as a church, we went to Cuenca, Ecuador and helped build a church there. And so uh, Bill McDonald has been the missionary that we have supported the longest. We're gonna take another trip to Cuenca, Ecuador this coming July and maybe the Lord would want you to come on that trip and be part of that great missions trip. But uh, Bill McDonald shared with us that when he arrived in Cuenca, Ecuador, the very first person he led to the Lord was a man named Rene. He led Rene to Christ. He baptized Rene in water. He trained Rene for ministry and Rene grew up and became uh, a pastor in one of the many churches that they've planted out of the home base church. Renee has a daughter named Jackie and some granddaughters. They moved to New York and last week at our newcomers coffee, I met Renee's daughter and his granddaughters who now come to Harvest Time Church. So 25 years, people have been sowing seeds of monthly giving and we've supported Bill McDonald and the first man that he led to Christ in Ecuador, his daughter and his granddaughters are now part of our church family. And the story doesn't stop there. Uh, a brother named Freddie was with us. Freddie has been worshiping with us for a couple months now, has an amazing testimony of how Jesus saved him and set him free and radically turned his life around. And Freddie came up to me at the end of the 
time together on Friday evening, he said, Pastor, he said, I'm from Cuenca, Ecuador. And he said, my family has seen the change that has happened in me uh, because Christ has come into my life and they want to go to church and I didn't know where to send them. But today I spoke with Jackie and with her daughters and I'm sending my family this week to Bill McDonald's church in Cuenca, Ecuador. The Bible says, Cast your seed upon the water, and after many days it'll come back to you, and it just keeps coming back, and it just keeps coming back, and it just keeps coming back. I want to tell you, nothing is wasted in the kingdom of God. Men sometimes, they're not responsible with the seed that you give. Sometimes it doesn't produce to your eye what you hoped it would produce, can I, but I can tell you, God never, ever wastes a seed. And it's going to take millennia for us to, to learn the stories, the backstories. We're going to sit around coffee tables and the angels will be there and they'll fill us in on what was happening from heaven's perspective from the seeds that we gave. If you're part of our family, if you, if you worship here at Harvest Time Church, if this is your home, I want to know if you'd take that card right now. And if you just consider uh, indicating a gift, this is a faith promise. This means that I'm trusting that through me, the Lord is going to supply uh, something on a weekly basis or a monthly basis or something this year over and above that's going to go towards the work of missions. The card is perforated. And so what we want you to do is we want you to tear the card and you can keep half for yourself that just uh, circle something weekly or monthly or annually that will remind you uh, what you have uh, just committed and put before the Lord and God we're trusting you to provide this and the other half comes to us so that we know this not only goes to support 56 missionaries, missions organizations training organizations that we support monthly but the trips that we do many times a year all around the world you know when I became the pastor of Harvest Time Church our giving to missions was about $50,000 a year and I remember when we were building this building and everyone was sacrificing I remember one day it just spilled out of my mouth. I said, uh, I want to set a goal of increasing our missions giving to $100,000 a year. But can I tell you, our missions giving didn't increase to $100,000 a year. It increased to $200,000, dollars $300,000, $400,000, a year. If you need a pledge card, just put up your hand. An usher will come and find their way to you, and they'll hand one to you. They're in your bulletins, and the ushers will find your way. In just one moment, um, we're going to ask you to bring your pledge card forward if you're part of our church family. But I want to ask Jeff Querfeld, our missions director, to come very quickly. I want to say thank you to Jeff and Christina. I want to thank Rosanna Sandromano and Mike Toman, our missions committee, for just doing an amazing job putting this weekend together. Yeah, come on, give them a, give them a hand. Jeff's going to tell us a little bit about the missionaries that we support and uh, how we can connect with them and lead us in a word of prayer. God bless you, Jeff. People you love so much. Father, I pray that this would be an extraordinary week, Lord, of answered prayer, of open doors, of breakthroughs, of miracles. I pray, Father, that telephones would ring. I pray that inboxes would bing, Lord. I pray that there would be doors of opportunity, Lord, that would just open for your people. I pray that at high levels, your people would be the topic of conversation, Lord, their promotion, their advance, Lord, their push forward. Father, I pray, God, that you would encamp around us and watch over us until we come together again. And everyone said, amen and amen. God bless you as you come bring your uh, faith promise card and have a great week in Jesus. We'll see you tonight.